Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar on NCPERS 2016 Public Retirement System Study and Dashboard Tutorial. Today's program is part of our Center for Online Learning. The purpose of NCPERS Center for Online Learning is to provide remote continuing education to public pension trustees, staff, and other fiduciaries and stakeholders. In today's webinar, we will be reviewing the findings of the 2016 Public Retirement System Study that was released earlier this month. NCPERS, in partnership with Cobalt Community Research, has been conducting this annual survey since 2011. What is interesting and unique about our study is that it gathers data from the full vertical profile of public plans, that is, state, provincial, county, and local plans. We will have a live demonstration of the study dashboard. The dashboard is a dynamic interactive interface that allows users to adjust survey parameters so that you can see the data that is of particular interest to you. It also allows you to make an apples to apples comparison. Leading us in today's webinar are William St. Amour and Pete Charette. William serves as research director at the Municipal Employees Retirement System of Michigan and as Executive Director of Co Cobalt Community Research. He has worked in the research and communications field for over 25 years. Pete Charette is an analyst at Cobalt. He holds a master's, uh, I'm sorry, he holds a bachelor's in business administration from Western Michigan University. And Pete is currently a candidate for, for a master's degree in marketing research at Michigan State University. As always, we encourage comments and questions However, in order to get through the presentation, we will hold all questions and comments till the end. Pete, William, the floor is yours. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we expect the presentation to last around 30 or 40 minutes, so we should have plenty of time for Q&A at the conclusion. Um, as Hank said, this is the sixth edition of the study, and we've been evolving the study each year by adding new questions, or removing ones that are no longer relevant. Last year, in an effort to give more ownership of the data, we created the interactive dashboard. This year, we added a few new wrinkles, including giving you the ability to see some direct apples to apples comparisons in the data. A little less than half of the respondents this year also responded in 2015. So in the dashboard, we added in those funds 2015 data as well. Now this dashboard, like the survey, continues to be a work in progress. So you will see it to evolve over the coming years. And if you have any suggestions or recommendations on how we can improve it, uh, please let us know. Before we dive in, I wanted to give a little background on Cobalt and who we are and what we do. We are a 501c3 nonprofit research coalition with a mission to provide research and education for governments, retirement systems, schools, and other nonprofits. We're located in Lansing, Michigan, and we are actually staffed through the Municipal Employees Retirement System of Michigan, so we are very familiar with many of the opportunities and challenges you all face. The 2016 survey was the sixth edition of the Public Employee Retirement System Study, which we like to boast as one of the most comprehensive surveys involving public retirement systems. Some of the goals of the study are to explore retirement practices, use the most recently available data to analyze fiscal conditions and operational integrity, and also we use it as a tool to crowdsource ideas, best practices, and strategies that other funds can possibly implement themselves. We've used the same methodology for collecting the data year after year. Essentially, we have two pools of respondents. The first, we invited any and all NCPERS members to complete the study, and we invited them via eBlast. In addition, we also pulled the top 500 funds based on their assets and total number of participants. After we removed out the funds who are already NCPERS members, we ended up with a total of, of around 250 out of that original 500. For this cohort, we used two paper mailings. In total, we invited 786 funds and heard back from 159 of them. Again, 71 of them were repeat respondents from 2015, and you'll be able to see that comparison data for funds on key dimensions such as funded status, contribution rates, and actuarial assumptions. 
The overall distribution of the respondents is very similar to what we have seen in prior year studies. And lastly, we did promise confidentiality so there's no identifiable information currently on the dashboard. We listed some of the key findings from the 2016 survey. These include the trend of public funds becoming more cost effective and responding funds reported the total cost of administering their funds and paying investment managers at 56 basis points. This was a decrease of four basis points from 2015. According to the 2016 Investment Company Factbook, the average expenses of most equity mutual funds averaged 68 basis points, and for hybrid funds, that's around 77. This means that funds with lower expenses provide a higher level benefit to their members and in turn provide um, a higher economic impact for communities that those members live in. Funds also continue to tighten benefits and assumptions. Almost 40% of the responding funds have lowered their actuarial assumed rate of return, and nearly an additional 30% are considering lowering it in the future. More than 30% of respondents have increased their employee contributions and raised benefit age or service requirements. Now the third point, funds are currently experiencing healthy three-year, five-year, and 20-year returns, which are close to or exceeding 8%. Gross one-year returns averaged 1.5% and varied between 1.2 for June fiscal year ends and 2.4 for December fiscal year ends, which are two of the most common fiscal year end dates. Signs continue to point towards long-term improvement in responding public employee retirement systems funded status. For the third consecutive year, responding funds experienced an increase in their average funding level. The aggregated average funded level is 76.2 which is up from 74.1 in 2015 and 71.5 in 2014. While the one-year investment returns were not as strong in 2015, almost 70% of responding funds have smoothing periods containing strong investment returns from 2012, 2013, and 2014. Also, many of the funds continue to lower their amortization periods, which lowers the amount of time to fully fund the plan. We also found income used to fund these pension programs comes from three sources, member contributions, employer contributions, and investment income. Investment returns are the most significant source. Member contributions make up around 7.5% and employer contributions are a little less than 19. Here are some of the tools available for the 2016 study. We have a hyperlink to the full PDF report and also list out the ways you can gain access to the Tableau dashboard. Lastly, Tableau has a free download for their reader software, which we recommend downloading when accessing the dashboard as it allows for better readability and more functionality. Okay, what we're gonna do now is go through a quick demonstration of the dashboard. So just give me a few seconds here to pull it up. When you access the dashboard, the first page you will see is this landing page. It contains the executive summary and key findings from the full report. It also contains a table of contents, which will allow you to navigate to each dashboard page. Within each page, you will also find the small return to table of contents button that will assist you in navigating. In addition, there are also tabs that you can use to navigate between pages. The first tab is who responded. You'll find that most of these pages have the same general look and feel where we have some of the filters along the upper right hand side of the screen and there are three different types of filters we use. The first is the radio button or circle which allows you to jump between the 2015 data which contains those 71 repeat respondents, the 2016 which contains all of the responding funds from this year's study, or you may select all, which will contain all 230 data points. 
the default is to display only the 2016 data. The other filters we have are boxes where you can multiple select or deselect your filters. And lastly, we have the slider bars where you can manipulate one or both of the endpoints. Below the filters, we have some brief commentary and then the table of contents icon in the bottom right. On each page, there's also a number of respondents box in the upper right hand corner. So as you change the filters, you will see how many of how many of the funds fall into those groups. For example, we will select the Social Security eligibility box in the upper right hand corner. And this is now showing those funds whose members are eligible for Social Security. You can see in the number of respondents box that there, there are 110 funds in that group. As you may have already seen, as you change the filters, the data on the screen will update dynamically. So in the Social Security eligibility box, you can see 100% is now displaying instead of 70, uh, 71%. This page contains several of the demo de demographic questions on the survey. We asked whether or not their members are eligible for Social Security, whether or not responding funds include overtime and their benefit final benefit uh, calculation, if the fund provides retiree health benefits, the, ch the type of jurisdiction they serve, and also the plan type. Most funds have at least a defined benefit plan, and some may offer both a DB or a DC, or exclusively have defined contribution. The other categories are combination plans, aka hybrid plans, which blend the DB and DC, and also cash balance plans. We ask funds to rate their satisfaction with their ability to address retirement trends and issues over the next two years. This scatter plot shows all of the rankings on the vertical or Y axis and on the horizontal or the X, we have the funds total number of actives and annuitants. As you hover over each data point, you'll see that more detail will appear. The average for the group is a little above an 8.1, which is up from an 8 last year and is up even more from a 7.8 in 2013 and a 7.4 in 2011. You, you can see by selecting and deselecting the fund size, there really isn't too much fluctuation with confidence levels based on the size of the fund. With these scatter plot charts, you also have the ability, ability to manipulate the data if you want to dig deeper. All you need to do is left click and draw a box around the funds you want to take a closer look at. That will bring up the option to keep only those data points or if you wanted to look at all the others, you would select exclude. So let's exclude some of those outliers so you can get a better idea of how the majority of responding funds are feeling. To revert back, you can just select the undo button. And next we'll take a look at plan expenses. Up top, we are aggregating the fund's investment basis points and administrative basis points. The scatter plot below is combining investment and administrative basis points into a total plan expense. And again, it is plotted out by the plan size. The average is around 57 basis points, which again is down from 2015. And with the scatter plot, again, you have the ability to dig deeper and exclude or look at some of those outliers. This page is showing three different actuarial assumptions for the respondents. The average investment assumption for the group is 7.5%. However, we found that almost 
a quarter of funds who also responded in 2015 had reduced their investment assumption between the two studies. Among those who made a change, they lowered their investment assumption by over a quarter of a percent. By selecting all, this brings up the distribution between the two years. For illustration, this fund, which is labeled number 146, lowered their assumption from a 7% in 2015 to a 6.75 in 2016. So that is just an example of how you can peel the onion and see some of those movements within the data. Selecting back to the 2016 data, you can see that the average inflation, inflation assumption is around 3%. But you see that there's more variety in responses ranging from 0% to 5% as compared to the investment assumption, which ranges mostly from 65 to 8.5%. Most funds have a five-year investment smoothing period. But you can also see that there are some outliers who have 30, 25, 10-year, or others. The last actuarial assumption we'll take a look at is the amortization period. The average amortization period is 23 years, which decreased by almost two years from last year's study. 34% of the respondents who also responded in 2015 reduced their amortization period between the two studies. This comparable group co collectively shortened their amortization period by an aggregate average of over five years. A newly tracked question in 2016 ask respondents to indicate whether their amortization period is open or rolling or if it's fixed or closed. Almost two-thirds of respondents have a closed fixed amortization period. The next few slides are looking at some of the actions public sector retirement funds are taking to ensure their operational integrity and improve their funded status. We ask respondents whether they have already implemented these changes, which are in blue, or if they are considering implementing the change in green. Looking at various plan, retirement plan changes, we see almost 40% of respondents have lowered their actuarial assumed rate of return, and another 30% are looking at lowering their assumed rate in the future. 35% have raised benefit age or service requirements, and 32% have increased employee contribution rates with an additional 14% looking at increasing their employee contribution rates. These graphs show which retirement benefits responding funds are currently offering to their membership in blue or in green you'll see that there is minimal activity in terms of responding funds considering offering additional benefits to their members. Most funds provide a disability benefit, in-service death benefit, and some variation of a cost of living adjustment, or a COLA. A new question asked in 2016 asked whether or not funds offer or are considering offering a plan for private sector employees. This is another area that saw a change between the 2015 and 2016 studies. Previously, the cost of living question was a close ended with fixed response options. This year, we asked it as an open ended question, which allowed for a variety of responses. This chart shows the distribution of funds offering their variety of COLA percentages. 34% of responding funds did not offer a COLA in their most recent fiscal year. The aggregated average of COLAs provided to members was around 1.4%. Now we can see by checking the Social Security eligibility boxes that funds who have members 
who are not eligible for Social Security tend to offer higher COLAs to help offset their membership's inability to access Social Security. Now, moving to some of the business practices that have been particularly popular. More than 60% of responding funds have requested an updated IRS letter of determination. More than 50% have conducted a death audit, provided an online portal for members, updated their asset allocation. In terms of considerations for implementing, less than a quarter of respondents may be updating their administrative software used for member data. Newly tracked in 2016 includes enhancing member financial wellness or retirement readiness, strengthen design standards for online communications, and conducting employer or reporting unit satisfaction surveys. Responding funds have focused or will be focusing on notifying members of updated employee handbooks and summary plan information. They have also expanded or are looking at expanding retirement planning education for members. And lastly, they've been providing fund staff with talking points on key issues. On top here, we have the 2016 data and the 2015 findings are below that. Areas with increased activity over 2015 includes participating in social media and having the ability to send mass phone or text messages to their entire membership. Newly tracked in 2016 asks funds whether or not they have a mobile application and if they allow board members to participate and vote via conference call. Below shows some of the oversight practices and the percent of responding funds who do each. Most oversight practices saw very little fluctuation between 2015 and 2016. A new question in 2016 asked funds whether or not they received their full actuarially determined contribution in the previous fiscal year. Around two-thirds of responding funds indicated that they have received 100% of the determined contribution. Reporting funds saw on average one year returns around 2%. The three year, five year, and 20 year average returns hovered around 8%. These healthy percentages point to continuing long-term improvement and funded status. Ten-year returns, which are driven mostly by the market crash of 2008, have aggregated returns around 6%. It is important to note that not all responding funds have the same fiscal year end date. The timing of when a fiscal year ended can account for a significant difference in investment experience between groups of funds. So we have added in 2016 a filter in the upper right hand corner that displays each fund's fiscal year end date. Funds who have a June fiscal year end date saw one year returns averaging around two and a half percent. For December year ends, they had returns slightly above one percent. Below the 2015 and 2016 returns, we have a chart displaying the gross one-year returns by the various asset classes. Real estate and private equity hedge fund alternatives saw the highest returns in 2016.
commodities and international equity both experienced negative returns. The graphs on this page show the responding fund's current asset allocations on the left, and on the right we have their target asset allocations. In the filters, we have responding funds one-year gross returns and 10-year gross returns. So you can see the asset allocation of the funds who reported the highest or lowest gross returns. Funds with the highest one-year returns had higher allocations to equities and lower exposure to fixed income. In the asset allocation, we had an open-ended comment for box um, for funds who selected other. The word cloud at the bottom shows what other asset classes funds are currently investing. The larger the word appears, the more frequently that appeared in the comments. Some of the top themes that we saw from these comments were funds allocated in real assets or real return, treasury inflated protected securities or TIPS, opportunistic investments, in master limited partnerships or MLPs. By clicking on the word cloud, you will be given direct access to the verbatim responses to that question. This page shows the overall funded percentage for responding funds, which is 76.2. They're aggregated sources of revenue, showing how much comes from employer contributions which is around 19%, member contributions, which is around 7%, and investment earnings. Investment income is by far the most significant source of revenue at 74%. And the findings in this study are consistent with what we have seen in other industry studies, showing annual fund expenditures and their overall impact on the local economy significantly exceed the annual contributions made by the plan sponsors or employers. And again, the scatter plot shows funded status by fund size. The black line indicates the average, aggregate average for responding funds, and the red line at 70% is what Fitch Ratings considers to be an adequately, adequately funded plan. Newly tracked in 2016 were two questions regarding health care plans. First, responding funds were asked whether or not their pension plan sponsors a health plan. And as you can see in the blue bar at the top, nearly two-thirds do not currently sponsor a health plan. The remaining 31% who indicated that they do in fact sponsor a health plan were asked what type they provide. Most provide a traditional health plan like an HMO, POS, or PPO. Of the 40% who do offer a health plan, we asked about plan eligibility. 80% of the responding funds who sponsor allow retirees to participate, 65% allow active members, and 57% allow beneficiaries to be eligible for the sponsored health plan. Our final page shows two word clouds. The first, we ask responding funds to list what strategy, strategies they have taken to reduce their unfunded accrued liability. Some of the top themes that we saw were increasing employee and employer contributions, making additional employer contributions over and above what is actuarially required, and reducing or closing their amortization period. Again, by clicking on the image, you will be taken to the verbatim comments. The other word cloud, we ask funds to share any innovations or best practices they have that may help other funds. The top themes that we saw were improving member experience by focusing on customer satisfaction and providing members self-service tools, 
providing member communications and outreach, building retirement readiness and awareness of their benefits, and lastly, implementing organizational efficiencies, such as automating processes or workflow efficiencies. So that's it for the demonstration. I'm going to turn it over to William now for a wrap up. Thanks, Pete, and I hope everybody found this a, a pretty interesting set of data. Uh, you'll find it useful as you dive into it and play around with it a little bit more. Uh, and it's really exciting to get in there and see some of the great things that are going on with retirement systems across the country. One of the things that come up sometimes uh, is interest in doing other kinds of data comparison. Uh, we do have a retirement system work group out there that's uh, doing some work specifically in the area currently of the normal retirement uh, process, a regular age and service. And the intent of that particular work group is to uh, really augment existing programs to provide high quality, uh, affordable research for funds that are not currently measuring satisfaction, or if you wanted to strap on some benchmarking questions to build more context in terms of what it is that you're doing and how your performance is. Um, it's something that's uh, pretty inexpensive if you're looking at getting into it. We have basically a, a core set of questions that all of the funds use. Uh, there's some pretty cool analysis that goes along with that, and it also ties in with the University of Michigan's American Customer Satisfaction Index, the ACSI, which allows us not only to benchmark to each other, but we can also uh, look at the broader public and private sectors uh, at the industry level and also for individual organizations. So examples, uh, we can look at the satisfaction levels for the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, uh, banks, health insurance companies, as well as other segments. So if you're interested, definitely reach out and contact us. Our contact information is on the slide, or you can pull us up on the website and reach out. And if we can do some things to help you out, either in the area of normal uh, uh, age and service retirement, or if there's some more specialized needs you have, um, we're happy to help you out. So the 2017 study will be rolled out in the fall, so we'll be collecting information again. Uh, please take the time to fill it out. Uh, it is a little bit on the long side, but the information is very valuable, and being able to have those kind of comparisons are really useful, especially when we're dealing with policymakers and the media that may not be as fully informed as we'd like them to be. Uh, again, here's our contact information for myself, for Pete, as well as for Hank, uh, and the websites to, to dive more deeply. With that, I'll turn it over to Hank. Great. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, William. Uh, wonderful presentation again. Um, I think you guys did such a great job. We haven't gotten any questions yet, so I will uh, ask our audience members, if you do have questions, if you look at your, along the left side of your screen, uh, there is um, uh, an ability to email or chat with us to send us your questions about the survey as well as the dashboard. Um, so let me ask, um, Oh, actually, we, we uh, got one question. Uh, let me just uh, read it real quickly. Um, for the question of health plan offered, is the only health plan through the DB plan? Does this include retiree health plans that are uh, provided by the employer through a separate OPEP plan? So on the survey itself, we asked specifically, what type of health plan does your pension plan sponsor? So it is a, a plan-sponsored kind of uh, thing. And then we have the various options of none or the traditional supplemental and health care subsidy. Yeah, I think uh, the focus here was to see how many of public plans uh, actually sponsor health plans as well. Um, I don't think our focus was to see how many uh, public employees actually had access to retiree health. Um, maybe something that we'll uh, dig into a little bit further and see whether we want to refine that or not, but I, I think our intent and the focus of the question was about whether the plan themselves sponsored a health plan. Um, Pete, William, uh, so you, know, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, essentially the invitation to participate went out to roughly about 750 plans. We got responses from uh, just under 160 plans. In terms of just st statistics, is, is that a good 
um, sort of representation and return? Is it typical, or, or what is this sort of the typical response rate? And you know, for those who are uh, you know listening and watching to this uh, webinar, and who may want to participate in the future, you know. Uh, what may be some of the barriers, and how can we alleviate some of that? So we had we ended up with about a 20% response rate, which is pretty strong. Uh, it's typically what we see with a lot of the research that we do in this area. Uh, so we used to do a lot of work on OPEP, for example, uh, and that's an area that we had about the same sort of response. Um, so it's pretty good in the aggregate. Where it starts to get a little bit thin is when you drill down into specific segments, so plans under a certain size or over a certain size. Uh, that's where having a larger response really helps firm up some of those drill down numbers. So um, in the future, we certainly want to have uh, more plans completing the survey. While we're good at the high level, we really want to beef up the ability to drill down and really get at some of those uh, smaller segment numbers too. Great. Uh, question we got is, uh, I'm not familiar with the retirement system work group that you mentioned. What topic is it uh, what topics are, is it working on? So currently we're working on the regular agent service uh, retirement process in terms of what the experience are. So we look at things uh, such as the uh, staff satisfaction. So what was their interaction with staff? We look at the online interaction. So if they use various uh, online tools, how that worked out for them, the written materials, uh, the educational kind of things. So that's the main area. We're looking at expanding it in the future in terms of um, other types of transactions. So it could be something as simple as a phone call or a uh, change of address kind of thing. And we're also starting to look a little bit more at things that are more operational metrics. So uh, really to allow that benchmarking so we can identify who does have the best practices, who can we talk to uh, within the public retirement community that might have a process better than what we're using today uh, just so we can all continue to learn and grow from each other. And then regarding the work group, um, is it by invitation only? Um, if you want to participate, what's the process? Yeah, just shoot me an email. Uh, there, there is a fee depending on how much data you want to have processed. Um, but right now, the, the most expensive thing if we're processing data for you monthly and doing a lot of the work on the survey uh, is under 5000 and. Uh, or less involvement, it's a lot lower than that. Great. Well, I think that was the last question. Um, so uh, let me uh, conclude by thanking uh, uh, William and Pete once again. And uh, for those of you who are uh, participating in this uh, webinar, at the conclusion, uh, there will be uh, three uh, 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 survey questions, very short, that we ask you to answer. And then uh, for uh, to mark on your calendar, the NCPERS next webinar will be on February 7th on the 2017 Code of Conduct for Public Pension Service Providers. So on behalf of myself, uh, William, Pete, and the NCPERS staff, thank you again for uh, tuning in, and we look forward to talking with you on February 7th. Thank you. Thanks, Hank. Thank you.